thank you for showing up. Uh, just a few things before we start. Uh, Paul McCartney has nothing to do with this title. <laughs> and secondly, if you were here last year, it will be deja vu all over again. So. Uh, here we go. Uh, Larry's admirably done the onshore portion. I knew the offshore portion. Of course, we do it in the water, so um, like I was introduced as uh, Harry Clausen, and I work for the uh, for the offshore petroleum board. As explorationists, we always start off with maps, and Newfoundland has a history of maps. Uh, you can sort of make out where you are here. The, the Grand Banks are there on the back over there. So, uh, you know, it would be tough to kind of use one of these maps. Uh, James Cook, after seven years of war, spent five seasons back in Newfoundland. His map is pretty good. It apparently was used uh, even up in the modern times. This was, of course, before he, uh, he went uh, uh, cruising around the Pacific. This is a modern map of uh, the Grand Banks. And you can, this is a vast area. It's like uh, 2,000 kilometers from the tip down here up to the tip of uh, Labrador, and about uh, 1,200 or 12,000. Uh, I'll get the right yet. 1,200 kilometers across. Uh, yes, across from. And you can see some of the portions here: the French Cap, the Grand Bank. The white areas are the continental shelves. Uh, the break over here is about 200 meters. So we get a vast area. Uh, knowledge came sparsely, of course. Uh, someone has broken these down at the Pacific base, but the fishing stage probably started uh, er well early before that. Uh, the, uh, the written record uh, starts in 1934 and continues with the governments and universities. And the petroleum ministry got really interested in about 1959. So what do we find out? We have a large continental shelf, good area, large basins with thick sediments. You only find oil and gas in sediments so far. Uh, tertiary and Cretaceous rocks are identified. And there is the potential for uh, structural traps. And while they're doing all this, they also uh, unraveled some of the plate tectonic history. Uh, I always like to joke that we're working on our latest ocean here, in this period, the Triassic. And this shows you the three periods of, as the, this basin opened up here. Yeah, going from, uh, from uh, south to north. This one's black and white because that's all we had. We had to wait till the color was discovered. That's a joke, really. Uh, the, the darker areas are the thick, uh, where the thick sediments are. And you can see off, uh, off, off of Newfoundland, the thick basins over on the, the other right. So those are good areas. If we look at a more modern map, we incorporate the onshore geology as well as uh, we provide color. And we're looking at uh, thick basal areas here off of Nova Scotia and also off of Lutheran. One of our other maps uh, shows the area, and this will become important as we start the story in Newfoundland. The green areas are salt. So salt was common in the Gulf Coast of uh, the U.S. And uh, folks recognize that uh, where you do get salt, you get uh, hydrocarbon traps. So this would probably be a good area to, to work on. And notice that we're, we're talking about the southern areas, southern uh, Newfoundland and uh, offshore uh, Nova Scotia. But let's, let's talk a bit about offshore drilling. We go to Santa Barbara in the 19th century. And this is offshore drilling. We did it from the dock. Uh, these dock areas. And not only here in, in, in uh, California, but also 
off of uh, the Gulf Coast in the U.S., various places in, in uh, around the world, like uh, Baku, where the were used. This is kind of what it looks like these days, and I guess everyone knows where the, uh, the oil and gas production is taking place, right? Of course, it's offshore. But the first oil drilled offshore in, in, uh, in Canada was not really drilled in salt water, it was drilled in fresh water. And, of course, uh, Larry alluded to a lot of work that happened in, in, the, in the, uh, the southern Ontario. Uh, the, the red here is, is gas, and the green is oil. So, uh, one of the first wells was drilled in off these docks back in 1913 in, in, in Ontario. And there is offshore work happening there, even as we speak. One of the major milestones was the first well drilled out of sight of land in 1947. And that was about 68 years ago. And I also uh, like to say that that was about the same time that the Duke happened in, uh, in Alberta. Hard me while I get some water. So why is Alberta important? It, it brings up every company to, to Alberta, and the folks are ready to explore Canada. And of course, Alberta went crazy. But let's look at some of the milestones in, in the Atlantic area. It really started in 1959 with Mobile, and that was down off Sable Island. And uh, uh, by 1964, there's some seismic offshore in Newfoundland. And in 1965, we had some core drilling uh, off the Grand Bank in the southern area with the uh, drill ship called drill. That was uh, geotechnical to see what the bottom of the surface uh, looked like. The actual first offshore well was drilled by Amoco and, and uh, Imperial using the rig, the Glomar Cert. And just for context, Lester Pearson was the PM. Joey Smallwood is the premier, and Montreal won the Stanley Cup. And in 71, the first well was drilled off Labrador. So in 1972, while uh, uh, Amoco was drilling to the south, Mobile uh, uh, drilled an oil shore on a well called the Dolphus. The first true hydrocarbon discovery of major proportions was off Labrador, where uh, the Bjarni well tested uh, large quantities of gas. First, 1979 was the big year, well number 60 in the whole area. Uh, that's the one that discovered the Hibernia field. In context again, Joe Clark is PM, Hexford is Premier, and Montreal is still winning the Stanley Cup. Okay, the uh, first oil at uh, Hibernia is 1997. Craig Chan is PM, Tobin is Premier. Who are these Detroit guys? Mm -hmm. Then that's followed, of course, by Jared Lomai and White Girls. And uh, why am I showing the same slides as Larry's? I guess because I like the guys' mutton chops. <laughs> <laughs> that would take me like 50 years to grow, so. And of course, we know about the first well in, in, in Ontario. 1902, one of the first wells in, in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, the big Dingman discovery uh, just south of Calgary, which kicked off a lot of work there in 1914. But the real big discovery was 1947 at the Duke, and that's what opened up the modern industry throughout Canada. And of course, in order to look for oil and gas, you're going to have to need some land. And again, we're back to black and white. 120 million hectares, that's quite a bit of land. It's probably the, uh, the biz, biggest extent. So you can see that, that most of the east coast is under permit, including, uh, including Hudson Bay as well. So if you go from the permits, and here, here they are in living color in Labrador, 
You also need some traps or structures. And some of these uh, cross sections down the bottom indicate the uh, salt lines that you're looking at here. So those are good, be good places to drill, uh, drill some initial wells. And here you can see the, uh, this is back in 1973. We've got some wells down here, a lot off of Nova Scotia. Of course, if you have the land, you've got some idea of what you think you're going to be looking for, you have to go out and acquire some seismic. Uh, these are just uh, an example of sort of vessels that, uh, that were used in that, that hunt. Here's a vessel in wire in 3D. It's got a big array. It's pulling behind it. Basically, you're, you're uh, uh, bouncing sound waves off, off the center to see what, what your structures are like, looking for traps and areas where you can find oil and gas. Or sometimes you have to spend some time in the harbor. This is an example of a Labrador shelf. The sediments are in yellow and green, and these are pre-Cambrian rocks with, uh, with low potential for petroleum. But right at the top is some paleozoic carbonate, and that, that's the discovery of Uyghur. And that's gas with the sun associated with it. So you can see the uh, steady climb uh, of seismic. Of course, the, uh, the dark brown is 2D or 2 dimensional. And when you start getting in 3D, that, that's really a, a product of, of the century. Because it, you get more data, it, it skews the graph quite a bit. Just to show you the total wells, we started off with a lot of exploration wells in a couple of periods, and we're sort of down to two or three a year. And development uh, after you, after uh, Hibernia comes online, is is is, is impressive. Okay, here's some of the original story. This appeared in the, uh, I think it was the Oil and Gas Journal. And the little, uh, little uh, portion showed that channel. Mobile off to the north here, Pan American, who uh, eventually became Africa. So they, this is where they drilled some portables to see what really the, uh, the immediate uh, subsurface looked like. <clears throat> From 24 wells, they got like uh, 900 meters of core. And of course, this is uh, some of the yellow uh, reports that we still have in our file from these days, dating back to 1965. You can see the, uh, the call driller, not really what you regard as drilling rig, right? but they got the job done. And of course, Pan American, as I said, became Amico. Um, based on some of the initial work that they'd done in, in there and, and the, uh, the, the core drilling in that area, they drilled two wells uh, back in 1966. The first one was Torres Cove, and the second one was Grand Falls, and they used a drill ship called the uh, CERT after the CERT Basin off Libya. Amico didn't have the greatest luck in the uh, portion here. They drilled something like uh, 31 rat holes. They had uh, under permit something like 34 million acres, or if you want the metric, 13.8. And you can see the two stars of the initial wells. This dates back to a paper that was given in 1974. And on your right, you can see some of the history that went in through here. Starting with the Glomar Cert in 66, and then, then bringing on some semi submersibles. And the big H to the north does not stand for hospital, it stands for Hibernia. So they missed it, which happens sometimes. Here's the rig that they used in the early 70s. It was purpose-built in, in uh, Halifax, uh, Setco High. 
the H went to Shell, the J went to Mobile. And here it is drawing on location in the Southern Grand Banks. Now, this is not a big surprise. In the uh, uh, late 60s, a similar looking rig, this one called the F, uh, drilled uh, 14 wells offshore in British Columbia. Nothing was discovered, <clears throat> and the rig went to work worldwide. Unfortunately, it was lost on Campeche, uh, Mexico, in 1979. But it did appear on the Canadian Geographical Journal at the time. These are some of the rigs that have been used off of, uh, off of Labrador. Basically, drill ships are easier, easier to, to disconnect if there's ice problems. The original well was drilled with a rig called the Typhoon, and all I got was this uh, shot from the microfiche, and uh, ready to go get the, the best going. It was a converted uh, Navy vessel from, uh, from the U.S. But we also had uh, jackups, just to give you the, the full range of vessels that are worked off. Uh, this is the Rolling Drill of Ford, the drill well on the west coast of Newfoundland. In fact, it was drilling offshore while uh, another well onshore was drilling uh, at an angle to get into the offshore as well. And sometime between May and June, this picture was taken. So this is close to the area that uh, Larry was showing you on the west coast in uh, <coughs> Port Port Peninsula. And in case you're wondering, both were dry holes. And this is a kind of a range of uh, vessels that are worked on the Grand Banks, from drill ships to semi-submersibles to, to modern uh, uh, drill ships like the Quran. The air crowd was an EP or a dynamic composition, which means it doesn't have to anchor up when it drills. Okay, let's get the hyperbole. Everyone's waiting for hyperbole, right? Okay. The uh, square shows the, uh, the wells that were built by Amoco down to the south, all dry holes. And of course, the Amoco report said, well, you should go north. Well, companies did go north, and they did discover Hibernia on a farm up from Mobile, Chevron drilled the Discovery well, P15 using a drill ship. And you can see these beds kind of roll, what we, what we experts call rollover structure. In, that they're looking at. I'll show you another picture of that. Of course, that changed everything in the offshore. Massive, uh, world-class discovery was made and had to be exploited. And in order to exploit it, the, uh, the two governments had to get their acts together. And these are the acts here. Another joke, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you might be interested, this is the 30th anniversary of signing the Atlantic Court, which sent, uh, sent uh, um, all, all of this stuff together so that we could, uh, so the companies could produce that work. From that, they went to, uh, to constructing a GD, oops, a GDS in Bull Arm. You can see it under construction here. It was towed out. And here it is currently that this uh, GBS sits on the ocean floor in about 18 years old life. And it's got uh, two rigs. You can do up to 60 wells off, off of this uh, structure here. Okay, let's look at the rollover again. There it is, actually. The blue is water, the green is oil, and the red is gas. And of course, if, you, if you're wondering about all these, these are the wells that are drilled off the platform. And you can see some of them have very long reach, something up to 10, 9 to 10 kilometers from, uh, from the surface location. The next field that come on was Terranova. It has a different method of production where they use a uh, MPSO vessel and subsea. Uh, I mean, below the ocean, right here. Uh, these wells 
produce gasoline that is taken away by uh, tankers. We go to the next one, which is the White Groves area. You can see all of these same elements, but this is as they say a lot of shot. The drill rig, the vessel on standby. The FPSO and there's the tanker. I'll show you from the front of this movie here. And of course, we've marched in the deeper water. We're down to about 125 meters of water here. That's our way goes. But of course, these advances came with a couple, some tragedy as well. There's the Ocean Ranger that sank in 1982. And part of that reason, uh, and the uh, commission afterwards, the Offshore Petroleum Board was established back in 1986. And more recently, the helicopter accident in uh, 2009. When we, uh, we, uh, the science did advance. We went from black and white to color. Mm -hmm. Another thing. And you can see it's getting, uh, but basically the yellow on the right shows you the uh, producing possible sands that we're worthwhile looking at. The uh, main one here is, of course, the Hibernia formation, and then the other one, the Nevis, which produces the white roads. And then if you get to the John Dark sand over here, it's one that produces, produces that cherry roll. But down below here, you can see all the screen stuff, that salt. Remember, that's, that's the kind of play that Anilco was going after, rather than big role wars. Uh, they have proven petroleum system off Labrador yet, with a number of sands that, that produce in that area. And there's potential for getting into the uh, deeper water with the uh, with new lands in Labrador. So that's a lot of the basic stuff. Now I can kind of update you as to where, where the things are going right now. Uh, the slide shows something like uh, 20 sedimentary basins. That doesn't mean that every sedimentary basin offshore is going to give you a lot of gas. But we have at least uh, four basins that are proven. And of course, there's the West Coast as well. You can look offshore uh, from the West Coast. This is our this is our current landing picture, and the, uh, it's hard to see because it's such a big area. Everything gets reduced. The uh, exploration licenses are in green. The uh, significant discoveries are almost impossible to see, and, and the production licenses, which are mainly in this area here in the dark face, are even harder to see. But you can see the black areas. To uh, agenda, I guess, is that the name code? We have to call it. Uh, our new, uh, our part of the new land regime that we're working at the, at the board. And these areas give the companies longer periods to, to evaluate before we actually give out parcels that they can bid on in that area. The other things in here, in the gray area is the French block here, uh, foreign territory. This is the boundary between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And this is the 200 nautical mile line between. As you can see, a lot of this uh, area over in here is, is uh, further away than that. Okay, seismic coverage, probably today, like, uh, if you stretched it all out, uh, you have about 2.4 million kilometers of uh, line data. A lot of non-digital data shot in the early days, wired in the early days. Digital data pretty much confined to uh, areas of, of the genre basin and uh, in that area. And some three uh, surveys down in the West area. And nothing much has happened in Labrador since about 1985. 
And the gas that's been discovered there is, is what uh, we would term stranded gas. This is the uh, graph showing the production from day one. The green is Hyperia, the red is Chernova, the blue is White Rose, and you can see some more families. But you can sort of see also that when you're peaking in this area, there is some decline of uh, um, production. But to date, uh, we're looking at about 1.5 million barrels. So the next big thing is Hebron. And Hebron was discovered in 1981. Again, we're in a, uh, sort of back to the future. The uh, Hebron platform was construction, that's under construction at uh, Millar. And the next big challenge after uh, rolling with uh, Hebron will be uh, the deep water. In 19, 2013, uh, Stat Oil, the big one of the world's largest oil discoveries until 2013. And uh, based on that discovery, uh, we have been receiving a lot of interest from all over the world, various companies in, in this area that we call the Flemish Pass Basin. The red area indicates where that one is here. Now, other discoveries that Stavo was talking about are risen are boom. And they're currently drilling in, in this area, uh, basically in that red circle. Uh, this area is in about 1,100 meters of water, and it's about 470 kilometers east of St. John's. And so, just for context, again, if you're driving from St. John's to Badger, that's about the same kind of distance. This is an example of uh, another uh, DP or dynamic transition drill rig. It's currently uh, working off uh, for Hyperion, but the company that owns these rigs, uh, the names of West Hercules and West Mira, Hercules is currently working in the uh, uh, French Pass Okay, uh, this is the legal thing. You have to read all of these before I can show you the next slide. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's a list of assumptions, and we always like to put our assumptions before we show you the graph. So that uh, you can see that uh, most of these things are declining. Even with Hebron, which is in green, there's a lot of decline. Now, the next big thing which we talked about was the deep water, and we still don't know the, uh, the total scope of those things, which might give you another another big, uh, large uh, feature on this graph here. Okay, with that, I come to the end. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at the board, Larry Hicks and his colleagues at the uh, Natural Resources, and Natalie Shea, who's uh, currently stuck at Halifax. And this is the Henry Goodridge off of Bell Island. So that's all I have. Thank you.